It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Kiwetanong. Miigwech, uh, Speaker. Um, um, my question is to the Premier. For years, the Premier repeatedly promised that he would not touch the Greenbelt, but he broke the promise. And now he says uh, he he says he always thought the green belt was a scam. The premier said one thing in public while planning something different behind closed doors. As part of the, uh, the seven grandfather teachings, it's time for some honesty. Will the premier rule out more cuts to the green belt, yes or no? And to reply, the government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, look, I've talked about this a lot, and uh, as we uh, mentioned uh, just yesterday, this isn't really about the green belt for the NDP, right? Uh, this is continuing on their ideological opposition to giving the people of the province of Ontario. Uh, the assistance that they need in moving forward. I said it last week, colleagues. You'll remember when we talked about this, right? For the NDP, what they want is a whole generation of Ontarians to be dependent solely on the government. That is what makes a socialist party like the NDP happy, right? They don't care what it takes as long as the people of the province of Ontario only are dependent on them for the government, then they are happy. Well, we have a different approach, Mr. Speaker. What we believe as progressive conservatives and have always believed is that you give the people of the province of Ontario the tools that they need to succeed, and they will succeed. And that is what generations of Ontarians Response. have done. That's why millions of people have come here, and that is why we have prospered, and we will continue to do that each and every day that we're given the honour to serve. Remind the members to make their comments to the chair. The supplementary question, the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, today's Auditor General's report on the environment reminds us that this government scrapped wetland targets in 2018 but didn't tell anyone for three years. The Auditor General herself only found out in 2021. So we want to know what other attacks on the environment is this government keeping a secret? To respond, the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate that question, especially as I'm going through estimates for the year ahead, so I'm happy to share with that member what we've got planned. Uh, Speaker, when it comes to lowering greenhouse gas emissions, Ontario leads Canada. We're doing it with the largest public transit investment in Canadian history, taking 28,000 cars off the road alone with the Ontario line. We're doing it partnering with industry, not driving those jobs out of Canada, but partnering with them to electrify the arc furnace at DeFasco. That's the equivalent of taking two million cars off the road and empowering a next generation with clean green jobs. And, and finally, uh, Speaker, you know, as you'll see in the estimates, we've committed a record investment for Greenland's protection. Last year alone, we protected almost 400,000 acres so Ontarians can get out, enjoy the great outdoors. Spons. We committed $14 million in this budget, and we're expanding wetlands through the Wetlands Conservation Partnership Program. So, Speaker, I could go on, and I'll share more in supplementary if I'm given the opportunity. My supplementary member from Hamilton West, Lancaster, Dundas. Um, Despite what we hear he in this House, this government secretly scrapped wetland targets, and the government repeatedly issued ministerial zoning orders, MZOs, to pave over provincially significant wetlands. Uh, this government also passed laws that forced conservation authorities, often under duress, to permit development on wetlands and floodplains, exposing people and property to flood risk. Last week, the Premier claimed he won't let developers build on ponds, wetlands and marshes, but why should anyone believe this government when the Premier has repeatedly let developers build on ponds, wetlands and marshes? They, they can double down any way they like, right? Question after question, year after year, it's all about the same thing, right? So they sat there in, uh, in, in cooperation with the Liberals well over 15 years. They had the balance of power. They put obstacle after obstacle after obstacle in the way of people, in the way of building homes, so that, as I said last week, this is one of the largest land masses in the world, and we have a housing 
crisis. So what is happening? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing is systematically eliminating all of those obstacles. And what are we seeing? We're seeing more homes being built than at any other time over the last decade and a half. And it's not just single-family homes. It is also purpose-built rentals. They're against all of that. Speaker, it is completely Response. inappropriate that somebody should have to wait 20, 21, 22, 25 offers before even being in the game. That's something they might be happy about. We're going to continue to reduce obstacles, eliminate them, and give people the hope of the first time. Next question, member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today, Metrolinx issued a statement that Crosslinks Transit Solutions intends to litigate and stop working with the TTC, delaying the delivery of the Eglinton Crosstown indefinitely. The minister assured the public that they were working on a solution. Instead, this is now the third lawsuit to delay the public-private partnership. Ontarians have already paid CTS half a billion dollars to settle two previous lawsuits. Given the announcement today, my question is simple. Is this minister in control of the P3 project or not? To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. I've always been clear. Our government is committed to getting this transit system built, but we want to make sure that it is safe for transit riders when that happens. I am extremely frustrated and disappointed by the latest delay tactics that CTS announced uh, just this morning. It's another delay tactic that's just meant to distract and delay from the work that needs to get done, and it is unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. But to be clear, construction is still ongoing and CTS still needs to provide Ontarians with a credible schedule. The project has gone on long enough. Communities across Eg the Eglinton Road and across Ontario have been waiting for too long for this transit system to open. I've been very clear with Metrolinx, Response. Mr. Speaker, that they need to do everything they can to force CTS to provide us with a credible schedule that will be able to allow us to give Ontarians, once and for all, a credible opening date. Supplementary Ontarians paid a steep premium for the contract with Crosslinks Transit Solution because the public were told that with a public-private partnership, the private would assume the risks and the public would benefit. Now we're hemorrhaging over a billion dollars with absolutely no timeline as to when the Eglinton LRT will be completed or a credible plan to complete it. Will the minister at least admit that this P3 project has failed. Minister of Transportation. Well, I will say, Mr. Speaker, and it's clear to everyone in this House, that the Liberals signed a contract with CTS in 2011, and they mismanaged it from the start, and our government has been learning from the Liberal mistakes. And that's why, when we put forward our subway plan for the GTA, we decided to do things differently. We brought in the Building Transit Faster Act, Mr. Speaker, a piece of legislation that allows us to get rid of unnecessary delays. We break up procurements on our new projects, Mr. Speaker, learning from Liberal mistakes of the past. And what are Ontarians seeing for these changes, Mr. Speaker? They're seeing real significant progress on the Ontario line, on the Scarborough subway extension, on the Eglinton Crosstown West extension, and on the Young North subway extension, Mr. Speaker, which are all projects that that member and her party opposite voted against. Mr. Speaker, we are Response. committed to delivering transit. We will make sure that CTS provides us with a credible schedule, and we will make sure it opens, and when it does open, it is safe for transit riders. The final supplementary. I'll tell the minister what, the Ont what Ontarians are dealing with. These are facts. Over 12 years of construction, over $13 billion in costs so far, Hundreds of small businesses hurt, tens of thousands of people's daily lives disrupted. And after all this, we still have no transit, not even a timeline or a credible plan. Given this disastrous result of the P3 project, has the government, this government and this minister, learned a lesson and commit to never using P3s to deliver vital public infrastructure? Will 
Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, well, we have learned one thing, and it's something that all Ontarians know, is that the Liberals made mistake after mistake after mistake when they were in government, and the NDP supported them when they held the balance of power, Mr. Speaker. We learned from the Liberal mistakes, and that's why we committed to doing things differently. But unfortunately for Ontarians, Mr. Speaker, that member and her party opposite don't support us. We brought forward the most ambitious transit expansion plan for the, G for the GTA, the most tr ambitious transit expansion plan anywhere in North America, and they voted against it. We bring forward operational funding support for the TTC as well as for all municipal transit systems, and they vote against it. Mr. Speaker, we are learning from the Liberal mistakes. We are doing things differently, and we do have shovels in the ground on our priority transit projects. We will get those done. But with respect to CTS, Mr. Speaker, we Response. expect them to fulfill the commitments they made to the people of Ontario in 2011 and to open a transit system that works and that is safe. The next question, member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. Violence in our schools is reaching deeply concerning levels. Yesterday, the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario reported that 77 per cent of their members have personally experienced violence or witnessed violence against another staff person. Crowded classrooms, lack of supports, and underfunding on mental health are all contributing to this crisis. But instead of addressing this problem, the Premier is busy musing about parents hitting kids at home. The tools to address this crisis are in the Premier's hands. When will he invest in schools to protect our kids and create a safe working environment for teachers and education workers? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. We all share an obligation to make sure our schools are safe among, amid rising violence taking place in communities across the country. That is exactly why this Premier and government increased funding in mental health by 550 per cent when compared to the former Liberals to ensure every child in a publicly funded school, English and French, Catholic and public, has access to the mental health support they need. I just stood proudly with the member from Burlington who announced a new strategy to lead the nation on mental health literacy in the curriculum, mandatory learning in grade 7 and 8 and grade 10 as well. Mr. Speaker, in addition to ensure we have more staff within our schools, while the increase in mental health funding has helped to deliver that, we just announced Bonds. a plan to hire 2,000 additional frontline educators focused on literacy and math. Across the board, we are working to ensure kids are safe, that they are learning, and they get back on track in this province. When teachers have to go to school in Kevlar, it's clear that the government's approach is not working. More than two in Order. five ETFO members have suffered a physical or psychological injury because of the increased workplace violence, and this problem will only worsen if we continue down this path. Our kids need supports. They need EAs. They need access to mental health professionals, and they need a government that actually cares. Why is this government continuing to dodge responsibility for the structural issues causing violence in our schools? Minister of Education. Speaker, in addition to increasing mental health funding, when you compare to the former Liberals, we're in investing $18 million. Today, under our Premier's leadership, we're investing $114 million. That will rise an additional $14 million next year and $16 million the year after that. When you look at the, the hiring of staff, there's nearly 8,000 additional education workers and teachers in publicly funded schools, yet there are not more students. And specifically to education assistants, we appreciate the critical work they do. We've hired over 3,000 of them. The interesting point to mention, though, Speaker, is when we put investments, even incremental investments, on the table, systematically, the NDP and the Liberals have opposed those investments. We should work together. We should come together to ensure children are safe, they have access to mental health supports they need, and they can succeed in Ontario schools. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Everywhere across Ontario, firefighters never hesitate to serve and protect their communities. Whether working in a volunteer or professional role, these dedicated women and men in our local fire services are on the front lines, keeping our communities safe. Being a firefighter is both rewarding and demanding, as there are extensive training and recertification requirements to remain current with industry best practices. At any emergency scene, firefighters can encounter many unforeseen risks and hazards. 
It is essential that all firefighters have access to training programs that will help them to better prepare for the challenges that they face every day. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting firefighters to ensure they have Question. necessary skills to do their job safely and effectively? Thank you. For labour, immigration, training, and skills development. Thank you much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for that uh, very important question, but most importantly, to thank the member for being a volunteer firefighter uh, in his riding. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, firefighters truly are often the first responders to emergencies. They are true heroes, and I want everyone to know that our government appreciates their service. That's why I was proud to be in Mississauga yesterday with our Premier, the Solicitor General, members of our caucus, and Greg Horton, the President of the Ontario Professional Firefighters Association, to announce $700,000 in funding to support training for professional and volunteer firefighters. It includes funding for new courses in auto extraction, boating and water safety, and elevator rescue. This funding will also support training that provides firefighters with safety and survival training for dangerous situations that, that can occur on the job, such as becoming lost, trapped, or injured. Response. Speaker, we will always make sure that our firefighters have the tools and resources they need. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. These investments made by our government into expanding firefighter training and supports is welcome news for firefighters and fire services across Ontario. And I first want to thank all of my firefighter colleagues across our province for their work in protecting our communities. And for the new recruits and for the new recruits in Mississauga who I got to chat with yesterday, thank you for standing up to serve your community. <laughs> Firefighting is among the most stressful careers in Ontario with the nature of the work being dangerous and unpredictable. The challenges they encounter can cause lasting impacts on their health and well-being. Tragically, Cancer is the leading cause of death among firefighters, accounting for more than 74 per cent of line-of-duty deaths in 2022. On average, 50 to 60 firefighters die of cancer yearly in Canada, half of whom are in Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please explain Question. what our government is doing to better support our firefighters? Thank you. Mr. Labour, Immigration, Skills, Training. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again uh, to the member. Speaker, our fire our firefighters are heroes who put their lives on the line every single day for all of us. When others run out of burning buildings, they are running into them. That is why our government made sure to expand WSIB eligibility for firefighters battling thyroid and pancreatic cancer, and we made it retroactive to January 1, 1960. <laughs> Speaker, by presuming uh, cancers uh, to uh, now include thyroid and pancreatic conditions, our firefighters will get faster access to compensation and other benefits, ultimately supporting their recovery. These changes will apply to any firefighter, whether they are full-time, volunteer and part-time, as well as firefighters employed by First Nations Band Councils Fonts. and fire investigators. Speaker, we will always stand shoulder to shoulder with our firefighters and fire departments and our heroes that are on the front lines every day serving all of us. Thank you. The next question, the member for Tumiskaming, Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The Premier stated that cash-strapped municipalities had a spending problem, nothing to do with Bill 23. The Minister also stated that they are sitting on millions of dollars of reserves. That's not the case in rural Northern Ontario. The town Order. of Cobalt, population 1,500, has been forced to raise its taxes by 12.5 per cent. Black River Matheson, population 3,500, has been forced to raise their taxes by 34.5 per cent. Does the minister suggest that they should totally deplete their reserves so they aren't, they're ready for any emergency, or is he actually going to make his promise true and keep these municipalities whole? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Speaker, um, the member opposite should read the uh, financial information reports that municipalities provide our ministry because clearly it does show uh, that there are billions of dollars uh, in reserves at the municipal level. But again, Speaker, this is the second time in as many weeks that a New Democrat has questioned uh, municipal spending. You know, I was a mayor for nine years. I was a CAO for just under a year. 
You know, I, we never blamed the provincial government. We had control over our budgets. We decided uh, the, the, the tax rate. We decided the services that we were going to provide our constituents. That decision was made around our council chamber table. So it's pretty rich coming from New Order. Democrats trying to spin an increase in a local council on the province of Ontario. It's wrong. I've said it last week to the, the member in Niagara that it was wrong, and I'll say it to uh, the member from Timiskam and Cochrane. Councils Fonts. are a mature level of government. They're elected by the people to make those decisions. I expect them to make them. The supplementary. I'd like to thank the minister for that uh, answer. I was a councillor as well for 12 years. Councils have to deal with the, the, the laws that they are given. So in Black River Matheson's case, they are trying to make sure that they are ready for the developments coming from, from the gold mining that's around them, but they can't charge development charges. That's what the government is putting on them. They have to deal with that. They are a mature level of government dealing with a government okay. that's putting things on them that they have no control of. Again, the government promised to keep these councils, these municipalities whole because of 23. Is he going to follow through on his promise? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The member opposite knows that we're working with municipalities on the audits to get the full picture of Bill 23. You know, this is again just uh, New Democrat math. The member opposite will never be a finance minister based on that question in the House today. You know, we've made decisions to work with our municipal partners. We're listening to our municipal partners moving forward. But you know, let's let's call it what it is, Speaker. We have a fundamental uh, difference of opinion with New Democrats. We believe, as a government, that nonprofit and affordable housing should have the best possible opportunities to succeed, and that's to lower the baseline costs, ensuring that there are no fees or charges. We're always going to stand up for our not-for-profits uh, and our attainable housing. Unlike New Democrats, we continue Fonts. to want to add fees and add taxes. As the Premier has said many times, New Democrats have never seen a tax they didn't like. There you go. Just the next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Speaker. Um, my question is for the Minister of Mines. And, Speaker, the electric vehicle revolution is here. That's why we must act with urgency to ensure that Ontario capitalizes on this opportunity to transform the auto sector and create good jobs. While the NDP is the official opposition are still stubbornly saying no, our government is busy taking action to build the supply chain and secure game-changing investments. We know that mining companies, much like automotive companies, will seek out the best places to invest. We also know that these companies create jobs and economic prosperity wherever they set up shop. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is creating the conditions to attract investments that will maintain Ontario's competitive economic edge? Great question. To reply, the Minister of Mines. Oh, thank you to the member for the question. Speaker, Bill 71 was passed last week to increase the efficiency of the mining industry in Ontario. This is imperative if we want to remain a globally competitive jurisdiction. The opposition voted no to this oh. bill. Shocking. Even though they know that the mine minerals and EVs are getting sourced from China, wow. Russia, and the Congo, Order. places that do not share world-class social, environmental, and governance standards. Right? Speaker, Congo. instead of supporting a made in Ontario supply chain for critical minerals that will create jobs, reduce the reliance on nations like these, and strengthen our economy, the opposition, opposition said no. Wow. I guess they are satisfied. Wow. with the things the way they are right now. On Us? this side of the House, Speaker, we are not. That is why we are doing everything in our power to seize the generational opportunity that is, global need, that is the global need for critical minerals. Our thank you. Thank you very much. And the, thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And you know, uh, it really is quite sad that the opposition NDP continues to prove they're the party of no by voting against legislation that will advance mineral and economic opportunities for our province, especially for the North. The people of Ontario witnessed once again that the NDP are truly the no development party as they chose ideology over investments. While the opposition while the opposition continues to neglect the needs of Northern Ontario. 
Our government must be focused on creating opportunities that will bring jobs and prosperity to northern and indigenous communities. There is no supply chain without mining, but it all starts with exploration. Speaker, can the minister please expand on how our government is saying yes to supporting mining exploration? And to reply, once again, the Minister of Mines. Thank you again for the question. Speaker, in my riding of Timmins, after 33 years of the party of no, the people had enough. They had enough of the lack of action and neglect in the mining sector that is essential to northern communities like Timmins. Thankfully, our government, under Premier Ford's leadership, is priori prioritizing sectors that are important to the North by investing through the, our critical mineral strategy. We invested $35 million in our junior uh, exploration program to find mines of the future, but of course the NDP voted no. Yeah. Wow. Speaker, the NDP sure. voted against incentives that helped Ontario regain the top spot in Canada for exploration and in investments in 2022 totaling $989 million, wow. number one. It is irresponsible Response. that the NDP members from Northern Ridings and Mining Hubs are voting against exploration investments and against Bill 71, but that we have to come to expect from the party of no. They, they are neglecting the livelihoods of their constituents. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Auto insurance rates continue to climb in Ontario, but in Brampton, it has been reported that auto insurance premiums are up by 37 per cent since 2021, meaning Bramptonians pay the highest auto insurance rates in all of North America. Speaker, this government keeps giving auto insurance companies the green light to put their hands deep into the pockets of drivers. So, Premier, Please tell the people of Brampton why they deserve to pay the highest auto insurance rates in North America. To reply, the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Merci, uh, Monsieur le Président, and thank you through you to the member opposite for that question. You know, Mr. Speaker, we understand the uh, and share the concerns that drivers have regarding the cost of auto insurance and no question costs are up you know and that's why mr speaker we have uh, been getting things done in fact in the 2023 budget we continue to build on that work we've uh, helped the consumer save 1.8 billion dollars on their auto insurance over the last couple of years mr speaker but mr speaker i'm not sure the member opposite and his team over there have ever met a driver that they liked because when, Mr. Speaker, we took the tolls off the 412 and the 418 wow, in Durham, they voted against it. Oh, Mr. Whoa. Speaker, when we cut the gas tax, which way did they vote? Did they vote yes or Order. no? Order. Oh. Response. Mr. Speaker, when we reduced the validation stickers and actually rebated two years of uh, fees, which way did they vote, Mr. Speaker? No. Mr. Speaker, what does the opposition have against drivers? The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It is quite obvious from that answer if anybody that this government loves more than the Greenbelt developers is the auto insurance companies. Last term, your Conservative government rejected an NDP bill aimed at lowering insurance rate pledging to take independent action. However, recent reports reveal a 12 per cent surge in Ontario car insurance rates, with some areas in Niagara witnessing 18 per cent hikes. Regular families already grappling with the cost of living increases have not seen the promised action from this Conservative government. Billion-dollar car insurance companies under this government's watch are permitted to exploit Ontarians. Premier, through you, Speaker. Why will you not utilize your power to mandate lower rates across Ontario? Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I know uh, the, the member opposite, just like everyone on, in this House, reads, uh, reads uh, the newspaper and realizes that right across the world, insurance rates have gone up, Mr. Speaker. What's causing that? Well, labour shortages, of supply, uh, the price of everything has gone up. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? This government is doing something about it. In fact, the Solicitor General just announced over $50 million to attack auto theft, which is a component of rising insurance costs. 
in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, through the Ministry of Finance, we've gone and asked FISRA for data so we can attack fraud and abuse, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, we've also spoken with the Insurance Bureau of Canada to make sure that insurance uh, car company, uh, auto insurance companies in Ontario treat customers fairly, and we Spons. continue having a dialogue with them, Mr. Speaker. So this government is acting. We've been able to get some things done. There's more to do, and we're going to continue working on behalf of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, it's abundantly clear that the Premier is intent on destroying the people's green belt. And last week, the Premier said, Speaker, and I quote, the green belt is just a big scam. Speaker, what is it the Premier has a problem with? Is it protecting farmland and ensuring food security? Is it that the green belt is widely supported by people across party lines? Is it the fact that we are protecting Order. our natural spaces and heritage? Order. Or that we're protecting our aquifers and drinking water? In 2050, or is it the fact that in 2015 we added 20,000 acres at 21 river basins? Or is it that we're fighting sprawl and climate change? So, Speaker, through you, just exactly what is the Premier's problem with the Green Belt? <clears throat> and to respond, Government House Leader. Speaker, I mean, this is, a, this is a member who sat in a government that opened up the Green Belt 17 different times, right? He, he, he talks about farmers, but in this place, his party was the only party that evicted farmers from their land, right? I mean, his federal cousins right now have a program to reforest farmland, Mr. Speaker. He talks about sprawl. Well, the problem that we have is that people have no homes to buy. We have the largest landmass, one of the largest landmasses in the world, and we don't. And we have a housing crisis. A housing crisis. Why? Because. They put obstacles in the way year after year after year. They put obstacles in the way, and now families can't afford to buy homes. Young Ontarians who want to buy their first home can't afford to do it. Bots. People who are looking for rentals can't, can't find a rental. But finally, we've taken the obstacles out of the way, and we're getting the job done. Supplementary question. Added 20,000 acres, took out 340. Added 21 river basins, right? Big difference, but here, here's here's the crux of it. We all know order. that the premier didn't have a problem with come the green belt even before he got here to Queens Park. So in 2018, a video surfaced to the premier in a back room, promising his friends that he'd crack open the green belt. And after that video became public, the premier promised Ontarians again and again and again, "Don't worry, folks, I'm not going to touch the green belt." And in 2022, he did. So, Speaker. I'm just thinking here, if you get caught doing something and then promise again and again that you're not going to do it, and you continue to do that for years and years, okay, knowing full well that you're not going to do it anyway, how, how would you describe that, folks? So, Speaker, would the Premier and members opposite agree with me that Question. actually what I just described is the real scam here? Government House Leader. The real scam is, is that for 15 years, that member in his party systematically destroyed the province of Ontario with the cooperation of the, of the NDP. Speaker. They made it absolutely unaffordable to heat your home. Imagine the province of Ontario you had to choose between heating or eating. Liberal legacy, Mr. Speaker. They closed hospitals. They didn't build long-term care homes. They said that the North was a wasteland that nobody should invest in. That is the record of the Liberal Party. They brought this province to its knees. The highest tax jurisdiction, the most indebted jurisdiction. That is the legacy of the Liberal Party, and that is why they continue to be punished. That is the scam that they perpetrated on the people for 15 years. And what are Response. we doing? We return hope and opportunity to the province. Thousands of jobs are coming back. Stop the clock.
We can wait all morning if need be. I think there's a member that's ready to ask a question. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs. Our government must recognize the tremendous potential of Indigenous businesses in helping to build a stronger Ontario. But sadly, for many years, under the previous Liberal government, they chose to ignore the potential economic development opportunities that many Indigenous businesses had to offer. That is why it is crucial that our government supports the vital work that Indigenous communities and business, businesses provide to our province. For example, at a time when our province is leading the way in mineral exploration, critical infrastructure projects, and clean energy initiatives, it is essential that our government continues to collaborate with Indigenous communities as partners in these sectors. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is promoting economic development and improving employment opportunities for Indigenous people in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister Affairs. I want to thank the member from Brantford Brant. This is an important question, Mr. Speaker. As we stare down the opportunity as Ontarians, we want to make sure that Indigenous communities and Indigenous businesses are in play, Mr. Speaker. That's why, whether it's through our ministry, the Indigenous Affairs focus on economic diversification, business and community funds, and re regional partnership grants, we've paired with the Chiefs of Ontario to support Indigenous businesses through a grant and loan program, e-commerce, supply chain mapping, training and economic development, Mr. Speaker, and one of my favourites, an opportunity for apprenticeship reconciliation. This is where Indigenous peoples have for a long time worked on major projects in their communities, Mr. Speaker, never received the hours that they ought to have if they were to apply it to a Red Seal certificate. This is an opportunity Response. to reconcile their, uh, reconcile their skill set and contribute to local large-scale energy uh, and infrastructure projects for their communities and regional economic development. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The partnerships that the minister described is just one example of how our government is committed to strengthening relationships with Indigenous partners and recognizing the excellent long-term results that will benefit everyone. However, there are many more economic development opportunities that are already present in Indigenous communities across our province particularly for Indigenous communities in rural, remote and northern regions of Ontario. Their needs are unique when considering opportunities that will create employment, reach markets and provide services. Speaker, can the minister please expand on programs that will support prosperity in Indigenous communities? Thank you. Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the Indigenous communities in southwestern Ontario know that we're working closely with them in the opportunity on the south end of the supply chain for electric vehicles and battery storage and legacy infrastructure. But up north, in addition to the two programs I just mentioned, the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund has sharpened its focus on the opportunity to support Indigenous businesses and young people in Indigenous skills. Uh, trades uh, job development. Mr. Speaker, this has manifested itself in the Pekanjikum Youth Sawmill, an incredible opportunity as that community opens up uh, the uh, White Feather Forest, Garden River First Nation to, inc uh, to increase ecotourism, working with Grand Council Treaty 3, Gamakan, Bimadizuan Turtle Lodge project to be used for year round training. Uh, I apologize, healing and event uh, space and providing black diamond drilling, Mr. Response. Speaker, a company we met at PDAC and have already started to encourage the expansion of their business, uh, Mr. Speaker, in the mining sector. We're proud of those. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, Cara Prechnik lives in St. Catharines, Ontario. Her landlord just hiked her rent by $350 a month. It's a 17 per cent rent hike. If Cara had known she was going to receive a rent hike like this, she would never have moved in. 
But even the government's own brochure for tenants and landlords fails to explain that rentals first occupied after November 2018 are exempt from rent control. Premier, do you think it is acceptable for renters living in new rental homes to receive 17 per cent rent hikes? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, you know, Speaker, through you to the member, I, I, I thought that perhaps the member would uh, celebrate the fact that we've got uh, politicians from Niagara Region here and our historic uh, investment in our homelessness prevention program, yeah, yeah. something that uh, Niagara politicians have been advocating for years. So, you know, appreciate the reception we had last night. Um, the, 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 the issue that the member brings forward uh, is at the fundamental core to our housing supply action plan. We made a decision as a government in 2018 uh, that was going to benefit uh, opportunities for um, more housing stock. And what has happened? Two record years wow. in terms of purpose-built rental. So now our housing supply action plan are turning on other me measures. The bill before the House, Bill 97, uh, the Helping Home Buyers Protecting Tenants Act, will provide a number of Response. protections for tenants in the province. And you know the member opposite still hasn't tipped her hand. Is she going to stand up for tenants and support Bill 97? That's the question, Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Minister, renters are not being helped by the Conservatives. They're being harmed by them. Yeah. It's not just CARA, Minister. A new report by Urban Nation shows that rental prices are skyrocketing at alarming rates, well beyond what people can afford. Rent in Toronto for an available one-bedroom went up 20.5 per cent last year. In Markham, rent went up 30 per cent. In Brampton, 31 per cent. In Scarborough, 32 per cent. No one can afford rent hikes like this, Minister. How high does rent have to get for the Conservatives to realise their housing plan is not working? Minister of Affairs and Housing. Well, again, Speaker, as the Premier said many times, it's supply and demand. We have a severe housing supply shortage in the province, and we're going to do whatever it takes as a government uh, to solve that problem. We've committed uh, to building 1.5 million homes by 2031. But you know, her assertions are are incorrect. You know, you know, this year, Speaker, the vast majority of renters, because of our intervention and because we invoked the cap when inflation was over 5%. Uh, the vast majority of renters had their rents capped at 2.5 per cent. We were one of the only provinces or Order. territories in Canada that during the pandemic had a rent freeze and ensured Order. that evictions would not take place when our most vulnerable needed us. And what were the policies we put forward? Pro-rental housing policies. And again, Speaker, the member, when it came time for her to cut the fees and charges on new family-sized rental accommodations, she voted against that. No. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My questions are to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry for fair compensation for ministry employees. Speaker, summer is just around the corner, and across the province, people are getting geared up to head outdoors. Most people in Northern Ontario head out onto treaty land to enjoy the beautiful natural resources that we are so lucky to have. To ensure that everyone can access these lands safely and responsibly, we rely on the hard work of conservation officers. Despite the de demands placed on conservation officers to carry out duties ranging from inspections, investigations and enforcement, they are being grossly underpaid when compared with other provincial employees doing similar work. In 2022, conservation officers came to Queen's Park demanding a wage that reflects their work. The minister said that he would support their effort and ensure they are treated fairly. My question, will the minister commit to resolving the classification issue to conservation officers raised in October and pay them a wage that reflects their duties? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thanks to the member opposite for the question. And I want to celebrate the great work that conservation officers do throughout Ontario. Unquestionably, all over this province, every day they interact with people and are doing a fantastic job. 
uh, and protecting our natural resources and making sure that those interactions are positive ones. And Mr. Speaker, we continue to work with conservation officers. My understanding is that OPSU and the employer are working on a classification review. And I under also understand that the director of our enforcement branch is part of the committee's design to review this classification. But Mr. Speaker, I also want to highlight that we brought more conservation officers to Ontario, more boots on the ground. 25 new CO positions graduated last year and are helping the people of Ontario every single Spons. day. I thank them for their work. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Minister. If employees are not paid fair wages, they will end up looking for work elsewhere. This isn't just happening with conservation officers. Last fall, I wrote to the Minister of Natural Resources about staffing issues in the aviation, forest fire and emergency services after receiving complaints about the high turnover rate among wildland firefighters in Chapleau due to low wages. The minister assured me in his response that the MNRF was exploring recruitment and retention strategies to overcome the staffing shortages. Last week, I was informed by Chapleau Cree Chief Corston that Chapleau will only have four operating crews this season, down from 10 last season. Speaker, with forest fire season starting earlier and lasting longer, communities in the north are put at risk if we are not ready to respond quickly and effectively. Will the minister immediately raise wages for wildland firefighters and maintain adequate staffing levels in the AFFES across northern Ontario? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, I was proud a couple of weeks ago to uh, visit the AFSEF uh, base in Thunder Bay uh, and visit the great people there doing work to protect us as we prepare for this wildland fire season. Mr. Speaker, we've seen what can happen in Alberta, and we know that our people actually are in Alberta right now, as I discussed in this House, supporting those fine people to get them back to some level of normalcy. Those firefighters. Those firefighters, Mr. Speaker, are ready to go in Ontario, and we have crews that will assist any time wildland fire breaks out in Ontario. We have prepared. We are prepared. Those great people are ready to get in the planes, the helicopters, be on the ground, and keep Ontario safe from wildland fires. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton East. Here, here. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Litter negatively impacts our environment, wildlife, our economy, and destroys the natural beauty of our province. That's why our government must take action to ensure that we properly address this issue. The people of my riding, as well as individuals and families across Ontario, value our province's natural environment and are eager to contribute to its preservation. Right. Ontarians are doing their part to keep our land and water clean and expect that our government will continue to take action to help protect our environment. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to effectively address the problem of litter in Ontario? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker, and a thank you to the member opposite for that important question and for the great work he does uh, for the people of Brampton. I know they care deeply about this subject. Speaker, it was our government that first, uh, thanks to the leadership of the member for Barry Innisfil, launched a day of action on litter, combating this and and engaging uh, speaker communities from across our great province. I don't care your political stripe. I thank the many men, women, children, seniors who got active and participated and reported into our ministry. It's going to be another historic year. We've also worked, uh, Speaker, with partners like Pollution Probe, launching the largest of its kind, the Great Lakes Plastic Capture uh, Cleanup, uh, capturing microplastics in harbours in my own community. It's in fact the sea bins are in Coburg Harbour as we speak, capturing a microplastics and partnering with the UFT trash team uh, to study the impacts that these plastics are having on our Great Lakes. Uh, speaker, and finally, we've uh, launched extended producer responsibility, transitioning the Blue Box, one system Response. across Ontario with among the highest targets in North America so that we can leave behind a cleaner, uh, a cleaner planet for our next generation. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the minister for that great response. It's always great to see him down in Brampton, uh, working with the member from Brampton North on different environmental issues. And it's encouraging to see that our government's taking decisive action to work to uh, working towards uh, to reduce, prevent, and divert water waste and uh, di divert waste and litter. The goal is to keep our lands, uh, our litter, out of landfills and away from our natural spaces. I hear that many residents, community groups, and schools in my riding want to be involved in actions that protect our environment by taking part in a litter cleanup. Each of us have a responsibility to do what we all can to help keep our province clean and maintain its natural beauty. Speaker, can the minister please provide information and resources that will help Ontarians preserve and protect our natural environment? Good. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. Well, again, I'd encourage all Ontarians to get active um, and participate in the Day of Action on Litter. It doesn't just have to be on that day. It could be every a day of the year, Speaker. I, in fact, was uh, just partnered with Earth Rangers to launch the Battery Blitz. We were in Thornhill, um, and it was an incredible opportunity to engage youth, to challenge them uh, to recycle the batteries. You know, Speaker, there wasn't a time uh, not long ago where these batteries were ending up in landfill. Thanks uh, to the leadership of this Premier, this government, we're now recycling those batteries. I was at CR Gummo in Coburg for the same thing, seeing how inspirational it was to see youth getting active on combating this. The member talked about wastewater infrastructure. Speaker, what we inherited from the previous Liberal government was a decade of darkness when it comes to investing in the critical Spons. infrastructure, wastewater and stormwater. We're building a new water power, a water station in Coburg, Speaker. We're building modern wastewater and water infrastructure to support a growing province so that our next thank you very much the next question the member for Sudbury. thank you very much speaker speaker in 2020 denise sendel placed a single white cross for her son miles who she lost to an overdose today Sudbury's crosses were changed to more than 244 crosses the office of the chief coroner just released its preliminary report and last year five northern cities had the highest opioid mortality rates per hundred thousand population Sudbury made the list along with North Bay, Thunder Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, and Timmins. Last year, 106 Sudburyans died from opioid-related overdoses, and that was an increase from 98. Those are the facts, and the facts don't lie, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. How many people have to die before the Premier admits that the Conservative government's actions have done nothing to address this crisis? Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. Quite the opposite, our government has been doing a great deal to support all Ontarians with respect to their mental health and addictions. With the roadmap to wellness and investments of $525 million on an annualized basis, the $3.8 billion, the $90 million that went specifically into the Addiction Recovery Fund, those beds are focused, 54 per cent of them, in Northern Ontario. What that has done is created 7,000 treatment spots. We are catching up and doing the work that wasn't done by the previous government, supported by the NDP. And those investments in Sudbury, for instance, over $12 million towards building a continuum of care. That includes over $2 million in annual new funding, specifically for children and youth, because we're investing Spons. not only in building a continuum of care, but in prevention and building resiliency in children as well. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the Premier. I've asked this question to the Premier several times. He has never answered, even though he's here. You know who's taking real action, Speaker? Razo Access Network. Since October, Razo has been running Sudbury's supervised consumption site, Speaker, and every day they help people and they save lives. But without provincial funding, they may not be able to continue beyond the end of this year. Speaker, Razo has been waiting to hear about the request for funding since August 2021. That's one year, nine months ago, they haven't heard a peep from this government. My question, Speaker, is will the Conservative government fund Sudbury's supervised consumption service so that Razo can continue to save lives? Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Okay. So, members will please take their seats. Once again, I'll point out to the House that it is inappropriate to make reference to the absence of another member but it is not inappropriate to make reference to the presence of another member. It's also within the standing orders, allows the government to respond to a question if they choose to respond, or any minister or any parliamentary assistant can respond. Start the clock. 
The response, the government house leader. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Look, Mr. Speaker, we've made historic investments, uh, uh, Speaker. But you know who doesn't show up and has never showed up? It is the NDP. Look, this is a group that had the balance of power in this place, and they like to forget about that, right? So they had the ability to keep the Liberals in power or to end the misery of the people of the province of Ontario, and they chose to keep them in power. Right. Now, Mr. Speaker, did. They, when they had the opportunity to demand anything, did they do anything on mental health? No. Did they do anything to stop the opiate crisis that was emerging at the time? No. Did they say, you have to invest in health care? No. Did they talk about jobs and the economy? No. They talked about a stretch goal in insurance and then abandoned that immediately. Sound familiar? Because it sounds exactly what the NDP in Ottawa are doing Spons? when it comes to the investments that we are making in the auto sector. They sit on their hands. They do nothing. They don't show up. They collect a paycheck, and then they go home, Mr. Right Speaker. Here. That's The next question, once again, the member for Brantford Brant. Well, if I may say, Mr. Speaker, it's very good to see you in the chair today. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. I was very pleased that my riding of Brantford Brant was able to celebrate the 99 day countdown to the start of the Ontario 55 plus summer games. And we are excited that this year's games will take place in our community from August 11 to August 13. The City of Brantford and the County of Brant were originally scheduled as a site for the 2021 winter version of the Games, but as we know, COVID messed up all those plans. But we are excited and eager for the opportunity to host the Games this summer. We owe it to the seniors of our province to support events that help to promote wellness, physical activity, and social connections within our communities. Speaker, can the Minister please provide more information? about how the Ontario 55 plus summer games Question. will create opportunities for seniors. Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the wonderful member from Brentford Brent for the question. He is doing a marvelous job advocating for seniors in his community. Thanks to the leadership of the Minister of Tourism, we have invested $235,000 through the Games Ontario program for the 2023 Ontario 55 Plus Great. Summer Games. Great. This event will bring together hundreds of seniors to stay active, socially connected, and for some friendly competition. I was so excited to celebrate the 99-day countdown to the events and tune in on the Games. Congratulations to everyone involved in this fantastic event. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It was wonderful to have the minister in the riding and to have him share the gift of laughter with the group that was gathered for the event. The Ontario 55-plus Summer Games it's just one example of how our government commit, is committed to supporting active living and sports at all ages, stages of life. The Ontario 55 Plus Summer Games will attract participants and visitors from across our province and beyond, and will also be an opportunity to showcase our local communities and our local facilities. But while events such as these provide opportunities for seniors to participate in large-scale summer and winter games, it is also vital to the health and well-being of our seniors that they have access to programs and services year-round. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is making sure that seniors can stay active and connected every single day? Thank you. Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Mr. Speaker, seniors are the backbone of our society. That is why we have invested nearly $70 million since 2018 to fund nearly 
300 senior living centers across the province. Oh, great. They are keeping seniors active and socially connected. In fact, our government invested over $200,000 since 2018 into the Beckett Adult Leisure Center in Brentford. And it was this wonderful center that hosted us on May 3rd for the celebration. We are committed to seniors, Response. and we are pleased to share that there are only 90 more days until these games begin. Beautiful. Next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Mr. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Premier. The Better Way Alliance, a group of business owners, is in the House today, and their members across Ontario and Canada are creating good local jobs with good wages and paid sick days and fair scheduling, often in industries that do not offer these benefits. As they know, and we all learned during the pandemic, healthier communities lead to healthier economies. Almost all other OECD countries provide paid sick days, but this government cancelled the few paid sick days that were available during the pandemic. What is this government's plan to ensure that all workers in Ontario have mandated paid sick days to keep our workplaces and our economy healthy? Immigration training and skills development. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud under the leadership of Premier Ford that on October the 1st, we're increasing minimum wage uh, to $16.55 an hour. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the highest of all provinces uh, in the country. But furthermore, Mr. Speaker, under the leadership of Premier Ford, we are going to be the very first jurisdiction in all of North America to ensure that workers have portable benefits uh, in, in the province. There's millions of workers uh, today that don't have health uh, and dental benefits. So we're going to ensure that we uh, bring forward a plan uh, for portable benefits to help these workers. Um, and lastly, Mr. Speaker, uh, we are investing records, uh, record amounts in training programs to help people get better jobs and bigger paychecks. We know there's over 300,000 jobs going unfilled today. Uh, we're going to help lift people Response. up to get into meaningful employment to provide more income for themselves and their families. A supplementary question. And again to the Premier, 70 per cent of all Ontario jobs are created by small businesses, and the Better Way Alliance has identified lack of commercial rent standards as one of the biggest barriers to the successful operation of a small business. Many small businesses are forced to close or downsize because of unfair commercial rent increases and practices. An Indian importing company in Mississauga, East Cokesville, that's been operating since 1982, recently faced a 300 per cent rent increase. Instead of a planned expansion and hiring spree in 2023, the company was forced to lay off employees just to pay the rent. Will this government provide standards and protections for commercial leases? Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, you know, in the height of the pandemic, uh, the government acted quickly. Uh, you know, again, we always look for a partner uh, in the New Democrats, but we never seem to get it. Uh, you know, our government's done a, a myriad of things to help small businesses uh, weather the storm. Uh, you know, and again, the, the government is always there, as the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development talked about. You know, we continue to work with small business uh, on a daily basis. It would be nice uh, for a change uh, to actually have uh, an opposition who would join us in many of the initiatives on how we support small business. Thank you. That concludes our time for question period this morning.